Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of our Cal family, I extend a warm welcome to you all for the third and final day of Restart Sri Lanka. The investment summit organized by Cal aimed at training in Sri Lanka's next phase of growth. My name is Damon, and I'll be the host for tonight's uh, session. Over the last three days, we have had the privilege of bringing you all several industry experts to discuss and present their views on areas of economic importance. Our keynote speakers and panelists extensively discussed and presented their views about Sri Lanka's macroeconomic outlook, business prospect towards recovery, SOE reforms and asset allocation under the current environment through our online sessions. But after three very long days of talking to everyone through a small laptop screen, it finally feels good to see all of you all here gathered today in person for our final session. We would also like to thank the audience who have joined with us today through our online platforms. Today, we have gathered here for our final session of Restart Sri Lanka with a great line of speakers who are veterans in their respective fields. So I'm sure you all will find today's event both informative and engaging. And also to lift up your spirits, we have made sure we've got some fine foreign spirits to be served later in the night. So without further ado, let me invite Mr. Kanishka Manakara, Group Chief Operating Officer, Cal, to deliver the welcome address. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, very warm welcome to you all. Uh, yeah, what a great conference it has been. I know I'm a little biased, but it's gone really well. So congratulations to Trisha and the whole team for organizing it. Um, yeah, it's, I, have, I think I've been given a very easy task of introducing a team that needs <laughs> no introduction at all. So delighted to welcome uh, Kasturi Wilson, Sanat Manatunga, and Hasita Premaratna uh, to uh, take part in our, first, our panel discussion for this evening. Um, three corporates who can, um, who I come from different, um, you know, areas of the sphere, uh, bringing together very different perspectives and and, and skill sets. Um, so it will be very interesting to hear their conversation, um, and also a very interesting topic about how we shift mindsets away from crisis and into growth mode. Um, something that I have been thinking about a lot uh, over the last several months, and I'm sure a lot of you are thinking about as well. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to formally thank people who've been involved in this conference um, over the past three days. Um, <clears throat> I think the speakers and the panelists, Mr. Shehan Sema Singh, Governor Nandalal Veera Singh, former Governor Dr. Kumaraswamy, uh, Dr. Reza Bakir, uh, Mr. Suresh Shah, Florian uh, Weidinger and Charlie Robertson, all of whom uh, participated. Um, perspectives and insights that were really, really interesting, um, and I, I really got a lot out of it. Um, thank you to all the management teams of the listed companies who uh, participated and, you know, uh, shared your views. Um, it's, a, it's a time commitment that we all put in to manage these stakeholder uh, meetings, but it's really valuable and um, really adds value to the companies involved and also adds value to our market as well as the country. So. Uh, really appreciative to all of them. I'm sure it will pay dividends in the months to come. Um, thank you to all our clients who are here today and also who participated online. Um, you know, you, we do this all for you, um, and, and it's great to have all the participation, um, all the fund managers, both in Sri Lanka as well as overseas, who joined. Um, and last but not least, to our team, um, who worked very hard, banded together, and uh, uh, pulled off a really good conference. Well done, guys. Um, and now I think uh, next on the stage is Udishan. So Udishan will present his macroeconomic view, always very interesting to listen to. I'm sure you will all enjoy it uh, and, and do enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ganeshka. Next up, let me invite Mr. Udishan Jonas. Chief Strategist Kel for his presentation on macroeconomic outlook for Sri Lanka. Very good evening to you all.
sorry for the technical glitch. A very good evening to you all. Um, so in today's session, what we will look at is the outlook for Sri Lanka for the next couple of months, and also our view in terms of how the economy will pan out for 2024. Right? Um, when I, I'll start with the most Im important and interesting part of, of the macro uh, story, which is on the interest rates. Uh, and in terms of the interest rates, our view right now is that Sri Lanka and the Central Cap uh, Bank of Sri Lanka uh, is looking at easing monetary policy further. Uh, and uh, it has the required uh, reasons why Central Bank has to look at reducing policy rates in the next couple of months. Uh, for the main reason being, we are seeing inflation, which was one of the main concerns uh, that kept the central bank increasing interest rates, where our policy rates went uh, north of 28%, uh, is now starting to come down. And inflation is now down to 4%. We'll see inflation numbers fall into about 2% by the end of the year. And this is a lot stemming from the base effect. But the good thing is that the incremental increase that we saw in terms of product prices have now stalled. So even though we haven't seen a major reduction in terms of prices, uh, the escalation that we are seeing in prices have kind of kind come to a halt. Uh, so overall for the year, by the end of the year, we are looking at somewhere close to 1.5% to 2% by the end of the year in terms of inflation. It's entirely stemming from the base effect. Uh, and with inflation being low, the other main thing is that uh, the economic growth is not up to trajectory, right? So if you look at the left side chart here, the left side chart shows, uh, the, the dark blue line shows what Sri Lanka's GDP growth trajectory would have been if there was no crisis, right? But because of the crisis, our sustainable GDP growth has now adjusted downwards, which is what is depicted through the pink line. But where we are is what is depicted through the light blue line, right? So if you look at uh, the light blue line, we are way lower than what the new, even below the new sustainable GDP growth rate, right? Which means that Sri Lanka has a negative output gap and the central bank has to push Sri Lanka towards uh, economic, uh, or needs to give the required stimulus through monetary policy to kind of get us back to the sustainable growth rate, right? So. The gap is huge, so we've, we've plotted the, the, the numbers in terms of output gap. So Sri Lanka has a negative output gap, and, and the output gap is, is quite negative right now, which means that it needs a lot of stimulus in terms of monetary policy to kind of get the growth kicking in. Uh, the good thing with inflation is that uh, the demand-driven side of inflation has come to an halt, and one of the main reasons behind this is that the amount of money printing that we did, uh, excessive, we, we printed about, Sri Lanka printed about 2.7 trillion rupees of, of uh, monetary printing over the last one and a half years. That is now starting to reduce. Uh, so if you look at the left-hand side chart, it shows uh, the incremental money printing that took place every month. And if you look at the last few months, you're seeing that number. They are basically reducing their position in terms of the central bank holdings, right? So with no printing and the central bank entirely depending on market financing to finance its fiscal deficit, we are not going to see that demand-driven inflation. We, are, we saw the impact of the, the central bank putting enough and more money in the hands of people, and that converting into inflation where it went up to 70% levels is not going to be there because now it's being curtailed in terms of the amount that the central bank is printing. Uh, and the other positive news is that from a market liquidity perspective, market liquidity is turning positive, right? So there was a huge shortage in terms of uh, market liquidity in the last six months. And with more dollars coming in, foreign, uh, the balance of payment turn, turning positive, the central bank is buying those dollars to reserves and pumping rupee liquidity to the system, right? So the rupee availability in the, in the market has improved and will improve further with the expected improvement in the balance of payment and also the expected financial flows that we will talk about in, 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 the next, in, in, in our external sector, which will also mean that more dollars coming in can be converted into, into reserves and the central bank can infuse more money to the system, right? So better availability of credit uh, will also help in terms of uh, the interest rates being lower in the next three to four months, right? right? 
So from a policy rate perspective, we are expecting policy rates to reduce by about 200 basis points, and that will happen faster. So we expect policy rates to even start falling from the next uh, meeting. So there's two more meetings pending for the year, uh, one, one in October, I, I believe. Uh, and from that cycle onwards, we feel that the rate cuts will be, will be initiated. Uh, and this will have a trickle-down impact on, on the secondary market rates as well. So the Treasury bill rates, which are currently holding high because of the delays in terms of domestic debt restructure, and the government uh, increasingly financing their deficit through, through Treasury bills instead of long-term bonds, that composition will also happen where once the domestic debt restructure is concluded, you will see the government raising a lot more money through bonds than bills uh, at the moment, right? So, which will also re reduce the pressure in terms of interest rates on the short end, right? So, from our view, we would expect the 12-month the treasury bill to fall to about 10 to 12 percent, and the average weighted prime lending rate will fall to about 12 to 13 and a half percent by the end of the year. And the reasons behind it, and, and the main reason behind it, is, is the risk premium attached to the domestic debt restructuring, right? So this has been the main hold on in terms of why rates have not been coming down. And with the conclusion of it, you will see more participation coming in, in, into even the bond market. Uh, over the last two auctions, we haven't seen the pension funds participating in the bond auctions. There have been large auctions. Last auction was about 200 billion, but we haven't seen participation from the pension funds. But now, after the conclusion of the domestic debt restructure, the pension funds can start coming in and, and buying bonds from, from, from the auctions. Right? This will mean that with the reduction in terms of the risk, you will see the treasury bond rates are also falling off a cliff. Right? So even during the last three, four weeks, we saw a sudden spike in terms of interest rates because there was a suddenly a bond auction and the pension funds were not, to build, not, not there to subscribe. Right? So this phenomenon will reverse very soon. And and the conclusion of the domestic debt restructure will be done within the next two, three weeks. Right? And, and for sure, by the end of September, we'll, we'll see this happening, which will result in a faster reduction in terms of interest rates. So going into the fourth quarter, we are going to see a steep reduction in terms of interest rates. Right? So from an interest rate perspective, Sri Lanka is looking at a more accommodative stance. Then comes the story in terms of what is, what is our growth trajectory going to be? Where is Sri Lanka heading towards? By the end of the year, we're expecting GDP growth to be between negative 1.5% to negative 2%. Uh, and a lot of it is to do with the base effect that, is, that will kick in in the last two quarters of this year. Uh, but large part of the growth trajectory, the recovery cycle, will actually start coming in next year. Right? And, and tr traditionally, we've seen monetary policy taking easily about six to nine months to reflect in terms of the credit cycle and, and that converting in terms of GDP growth, right? So most of the, the growth will start kicking in from next year, and we have other factors which will also support the growth trajectory. So as you know, credit has started to pick up. Uh, overall, credit growth has turned positive month on month. Uh, still small amounts, which is why you don't realize it too much. But if you look at the appetite for demand and uh, the demand for credit, we are seeing companies now starting to relook at their borrowing requirement. Working capital requirement is increasing. Uh, so everyone's starting to plan for six months down the line, planning to increase capacity. Because keep in mind, last two, three years, most of the companies haven't increased capacity. They need to do refurbishments. They need to increase their capacity of their, their businesses. So they're kind of gearing up for them starting from now. So next six months, you will see this credit cycle also starting to happen, and that converting into GDP growth with businesses starting to pick up. And traditionally, we've seen, historically, we've seen private sector credit growth and GDP having a very strong correlation. So as, as long as there's a stable and, and, and moderate credit growth, we will see that converting into GDP growth, but uh, assume, uh, with, with the assumption that there's no other uh, turmoil or any other issues that kind of disrupt economic activity. The demand for de credit is also reflected in, in the surveys done by the central bank, where now uh, both the willingness to lend by the financial institution after the conclusion of the domestic debt restructure, 
because now banks and financial institutions also understand that their gearing positions are better, their tier one capitals are better. So the, the attitude and the willingness to lend from the financial institutions has also started to turn positive now, right? So they're willing to lend. And from the consumer side of things, you're also seeing demand, and this is a survey done by the central bank, where you're seeing now indicative uh, indication for credit is, has turned positive from the credit survey conducted by the central bank. And, and the companies that we're engaging with, all of them are indicating that now they are planning for next year, going into a better year for, for 2024, and which means that you need to start looking at expanding, right? And also sorting out issues in terms of working capital, the working capital requirement is increasing, so that's going to drive credit demand for, for 2024 and even the last quarter of 2023. Already you're seeing this starting to reflect in terms of your economic indicators. The PMI, the Purchasing Manager Index, has started, uh, is, is up 12% for the year. Obviously, the, the, the transportation activity is increased. It's reflecting in the, in the auto fuel sales. Electricity consumption, even though prices shot up, by 60-70%, consumption of electricity is back on track. It's, it's moving up to, to where it was. I think from, from the peak, we're only down about 10% from uh, where we were in, in 2021. Uh, overall import, export activity, uh, the cargo operations have also improved. So overall, we are seeing an improvement in or the indicators are now indicating that economic growth is also starting to kind of, is in the initial phases of recovery. One of the largest contributors that could make a material change to GDP would be tourism. Right? And tourism used to account for roughly about 4 to 5% of GDP. Right? And that contribution fell down to about 1.6% last year. But if you look at the numbers for the, the second half of this year, uh, we were averaging about 100,000 tourists during the first six months. We are going into about 150,000 plus in the second half of this year. Right? So there's a 50% increment in terms of the, the tourism, uh, tourism numbers coming in, and which will mean that the tourism component alone, because that's growing by a significant amount, that can have a material impact, or roughly about uh, for, for the year, just the impact for the second half of this year from tourism will be about 2.4%. So the growth increment that you can see from, from tourism will be about, or addition to growth, will be about 2.4%. So it will be a material contributor given the the size of, of, of uh, we're talking about uh, eventually tourism coming to about $5 billion in terms of revenue, uh, and that being roughly about, five, about 7% of our, our GDP in the, in the coming uh, years. The only sector we feel that might be slightly slower in terms of picking up would be construction. And, and construction historically has been a, a large component of our GDP and has been primarily driven by the government, right? And government infrastructure activity has been the preliminary driver of, of, of construction. Uh, and even on the private sector side, you're not seeing retail construction picking as fast as expected. It's the last thing that people have in mind, right? So people are still sorting out their, their basic needs. They're getting back on track in terms of what they were consuming before. Still a long way to go in terms of retail constructions to pick up, right? And if you look at, uh, from a government's perspective, the government is cutting down on CapEx. So if you look at the tax numbers, which we will show in the latest slides, tax numbers are not coming through as expected. So the, the only way that the government is still meeting their fiscal targets is by cutting down on the capital expenditure. Right? So for the year, Sri Lanka was planning for about 1.1 trillion of capital expenditure. We will only close at about 500 billion rupees of capital expenditure. So that cut will reflect in terms of the construction activity. So overall, we are expecting GDP growth to start kicking in. Next year, reaching 3% is not a big gas, to be honest. We can actually do more than 3% if tourism maintains the current trajectory and also if, if consumption starts picking in. Keep in mind, with the handouts given uh, with the World Bank program, you'll see the low ends of the population also getting a bit of money and that kind of stimulating into in economic activity and, and having ripple effects across, uh, across the system. Tourism is not only about the direct contribution, but also the indirect contribution it has on the overall economy. So that will also trickle down in terms of economic activity, right? So the, mod the commodity monetary stance, the recovery in terms of tourism, right? And also uh, the conclusion of the domestic debt exchange and more foreign activity coming in 
Uh, we'll see a little bit of foreign FDI is also starting to come in. A few projects will also start happening once the DDR is concluded. At the moment, countries like Japan can't do anything at the moment until, until the, the external debt restructuring is completed. So once even the external debt restructuring is concluded, we'll also see more money coming into to the FDI side of things as well. From an exchange rate perspective, uh, we don't expect a major depreciation of the currency till the end of the year. We are expecting the currency to hold stable at 320 to 330. And there is, there's a couple of reasons why. Uh, one of the, the, the significant slowdowns that we saw was on the, on the remittance side. Uh, the remittances have now started picking back up. Uh, we are on average uh, raising about $470 million a month in terms of remittances. Very soon it will be about $500 million in terms of remittances. Uh, the component of people were not sure of, of the, the stability of the country. So you're seeing now people coming back in terms of looking at investment side of things in Sri Lanka as well, right? Uh, one component which completely was kept away was people were just sending money for, for their families to survive. But now we are seeing the investment component of, of their, their contribution in terms of remittances also coming back into the system again. Uh, and as you all know that there has been a huge uh, uh, a migration spree which resulted roughly about 500, 600,000 people leaving over the last one and a half years. So that component will also start contributing in terms of adding to the remittance flows in, the, in 2024. So if you look at the, the worker remittances numbers, first half was about $2.8 billion. Second half, you're looking at about roughly $3.2 billion. Uh, that's an additional $400 million coming in, roughly looking at about, uh, roughly about $60, $70 million incremental worker remittances coming every month uh, compared to the first half of this year. And obviously the larger component would be the, the impact coming from tourism. Uh, tourism numbers are kicking in to, to or getting close to the 2018 numbers, which was the peak year for Sri Lanka. Uh, by the end of the year, we are expecting tourist numbers, arrival numbers, to, to cross 200,000 mark. Uh, this month, we did 142,000 for August. Uh, it's going to be easy hit in terms of crossing 200,000 by the end of the year. So going into the winter season, we'll see tourist arrivals crossing 200,000 per month. And what it means is that uh, your earnings from tourism, which was only about a billion dollars for the first half of this year, uh, will be about... 50% higher in the second half of this year, which is roughly about $1.6 billion coming in from tourism. Right? So major increase in terms of tourism earnings that you will see in the second half of this year, and especially towards the latter, quarter, latter part of the quarter. Right? Because remittances and, and, uh, remittances and tourism is, is making incremental moves in terms of the current account, uh, it doesn't matter whether import controls are allowed or not, right? So even if, when the import controls are allowed or taken off, the incremental increase in imports is not material enough to make a big difference in terms of covering up for, for uh, uh, the reduction in terms of uh, current account because work remittances and tourism are, are more than compensating for this component. Uh, and even when import controls are relaxed, we are yet to see a major spike and that's because of the purchasing power of, of the, the local consumer has not recovered to, to what it was. Uh, so from our perspective, we are looking at about, for the second half of this year, roughly about 50 to $100 million of import increases uh, happening, uh, uh, or import bill increasing by 50 to $100 million a month. But your incremental increase on tourism and, and, uh, and work remittances is more, that, more than that component. Right? So because of that, you're not going to see any major impact on the current account as such. The other good thing is that obviously the import prices have been holding low, so your import bill automatically has been holding low. Uh, from an overall perspective, balance of payment uh, is positive right now, uh, and a lot to do with the, the, the delays in terms of foreign debt payments, but also uh, the, the reduction in terms of the, the trade deficit has also helped us a lot in terms of keeping the balance of payment positive. So if you look at the first half of this year, we've recorded roughly about $2 billion of BOP surplus. And second half, we're looking at about roughly about $1.3 billion coming into, into 
the, the balance of payment surplus, right? So it's a reduction because first half there was not much imports and so on, but second half it kind of reduces, but still positive and enough to kind of build our reserve position to the, cent the IMF target. So IMF target is uh, $4.4 billion of reserve by the end of the year. Uh, and we are currently at about 3.7 to 3.8 billion dollars, which means that we only need about 700 million dollars of incremental reserve buildup, right? But our increase that we are going to see in the BOP is about 1.3 billion dollars, which means that we will be able to even ma make payments on a little bit more on the ACU uh, settlements, uh, pay a little bit of the or, or complete the Bangladesh swap uh, settlement, and a, a little bit of trade credit that we we took during the year can also be settled given the current equation running right now, right? So at the moment, currency doesn't seem to be too much of an issue, but going into 2024, obviously the debt repayments will start coming in, which will mean that roughly about $200 million a month of incremental payments will start every month. Plus, when vehicle imports are allowed, you'll see a sudden surge. It's, it's going to come with higher taxes, the prices are going to be higher, but obviously it will add to about at least $100 million in terms of incremental uh, addition to, to our import bill. Plus, obviously, when you're expecting economic growth and economic recovery, it comes with imports, right? So next year will be challenging uh, compared to this year in terms of the currency, uh, but it's not going to be major. You're, you're looking at about 5 to 7% in terms of a depreciation of the currency for next year. Uh, the other good news is that from a financial inflow perspective from, for in terms of uh, the multilateral and bilateral funding which is spending. Sri Lanka has a, about $900 million of financial inflows that they can then materialize and that's stemming from the IMF component coming in of $330 million, uh, coupled with the World Bank and ADB components of about another $300, $300 million. We have $900 million of financial inflows yet to come if we, if we complete the external debt restructure, right? So this also kind of gives you that cushion in terms of the currency. Right? And a lot of it can be converted into rupees. Uh, the World Bank component is coming for, for the, the, the handout program for the low-income families. So it will be converted into rupees. So all this will mean that you can kind of uh, see the currency not depreciating too much and uh, us being able to settle some of these loan payments, uh, especially on the trade creditor funds that we've taken during the last 24 months. The, the problem area from our perspective Obviously, interest rates look good. Growth is getting back on track. It's low, but it's getting back on track. Uh, exchange rate is stable, at least for the end of the year. But the problem area we feel is the fiscal side of things. Um, in terms of our targets, uh, Sri Lanka's tax revenue collections have not been as, as much as expected. Obviously, second half will be greater than the first half because of the activity pickup. But still, we are not going to meet the, the numbers that the IMF is looking at in terms of the targets of in terms of taxes. Uh, so how Sri Lanka has managed still to maintain the primary deficit and, and, and budget deficit targets is by cutting down on capex, right? By cut, and that's not something great going into a, into a uh, it, it, it affects your growth over the, uh, the long run. So the government will be forced to kind of look at capex to a certain extent in the coming years, right? Which means that the only way that we can manage the, the fiscal deficit and the primary deficit is to look at more tax increases and obviously collections, right? So collections have not been too great, uh, particularly on certain areas. VAT has been good, uh, the, the, the person, the advance, the, what on salaries, those taxes have been good, but where we've been falling short is on income tax collections as well as the import duties. So those two areas, uh, they will have to scrutinize more, collections they'll be pushing for more, but Obviously, the economic recovery will also kind of help with uh, vehicles used to be a large component to tax collections. All that will also start kicking in, but the government will look at incremental tax additions. Uh, we feel it will be more tilted towards collections rather than increasing the tax rates as such. The, the why we say the fiscal part is very important is that if we don't maintain the fiscal trajectory that is required by the IMF, we won't see our debt numbers coming now, right? So all these numbers, the debt restructuring works on us working on getting our debt to, uh, or deficit to GDP down to what is required by the, 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 the IMF. Right? 
the right hand chart shows that for example if we keep running at this 8% deficit which we will close at this year at if we keep running at those deficit levels we will be at that pink line on the right hand side which means that our debt to gdp stabilized at about 110% but it it doesn't come down to that 80% that we require right so which is why the fiscal part of it is very important right so tax collections have to, has to be relooked at by the government uh, in terms of expenditure there's limited areas for the government to actually reduce right because large component is interest now salaries have to be paid uh, the only component volatile component is the capex part of it but the government can't keep reducing their capex for for the foreseeable future so they have to kind of kick start some part of the capex program next year which means that a lot of focus will be going into into taxation and tax collections and and if you look at the jump that is required uh, so for 2023 on the primary deficit the 0.7% is manageable because we're cutting down on capex but the jumps that are required for the next couple of years is huge right and that means that you have to make major changes in terms of taxation and collections and also obviously the economic growth will also kind of make a play in terms of making a big difference on 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 the tax collection so tax is one area that the government will be have to look at seriously and and uh, which can have a material impact to the overall fiscal consolidation program of sri lanka right so as long as we do not do not re derail from the current trajectory and we keep uh, we need to improve on collections uh, ensure that there is no impediment to economic growth we can hit these numbers right so it's a matter of uh, and normally what happens is that the first year that you do your fiscal adjustments you don't see revenue coming up the actual increase in terms of revenue comes in in the subsequent years t t plus 1 and t plus 2 is when you really see the numbers starting to kick in so as long as the political and and other there's no other impediment in terms of growth automatically we should see this trajectory improving but obviously from a collection perspective there's much more that the government will have to kind of focus on so as i mentioned collections is an important issue uh, our import taxes as a percentage of total tax is very small and if you compare import duty collections uh, as a percentage of our import bill that is also very small compared to what you see in the region so one is from an import perspective collections need to be improved plus things like vehicles where your duties are 300 400% will also add a material change on the on the import duty numbers coming in and with the relaxation of import uh, the 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 all, all the ta uh, items taken out of the imports we'll see that also gradually coming back but from a duty perspective the component coming from customs is is not sufficient uh, from an excise perspective now the increase in terms of taxes what they've done on cigarettes and 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 alcohol is is turning out to be counterproductive because now you're seeing the the inelastic demand uh, kind of leading to lower revenue collections from from a excise duty perspective there's uh, so in a growth phase the government should not look at taxing more or at least reduce in terms of the taxation because it has come to a point where the low income uh, the population is not going to be keep keeping on increasing their consumption on on alcohol and tobacco when tax rates are going up right so that's one area uh, the performance has been below expectations from a government's perspective as well and obviously other component is your income tax collections the government is looking at digitalization and so on uh, next year they will look at uh, going into 2025 wealth taxes has been proposed by the imf the imf is looking at roughly about 400 billion rupees collected per annum through wealth taxes uh, it can be in the form of uh, a 1% 2% on on your entire wealth or they can just look at the financial sector and impose something like a, a higher WHT or taxation on, on, on your financial income. So these are ways and means that the IMF will be also looking at pushing Sri Lanka towards uh, hitting our fiscal targets. So compared to our previous 17 programs, our, this program, the IMF is more stringent. They are, they, are, they are more strict in terms of how they are looking at numbers and ensuring that we don't fall apart in, in terms of our fiscal numbers. Uh, but this is one area that uh, will as as investors we'll have to keep an eye on uh, because if if we fall short in terms of tax numbers and if you are not hitting these fiscal numbers which will mean that 
the government will also have to make material changes, which will obviously impact capital markets as well. So in terms of takeaways, obviously, from an interest rate perspective, interest rates should start falling faster. And that will happen by the end of the month when domestic debt restructuring is concluded. And we expect a reduction in terms of policy rate to start happening from, from the month of October. And the, the ripple effects in terms of your AWPLR and bond market rates coming down will also happen faster than expected. From a growth perspective, growth is gradually picking up. But next year is where you'll see material numbers coming in. And from a business environment, things will start looking better. From a price perspective, inflation is going to still remain low. We are not going to see any kind of demand-driven inflation because our, our growth is still be below potential. So that will also ensure that inflation doesn't kick in when, when growth kind of kicks in. Uh, from an exchange rate perspective, we're expecting stable currency until the end of the year. But next year, when we have debt payments coming and so on, there will be a 5 to 7% depreciation of the currency, which is manageable from a perspective of, of looking at Sri Lanka's past. Um, from a fiscal perspective, that will be the challenge. Government will have to put a lot of focus into, in terms of uh, improving collections. But also on the other side, reducing interest rates makes a material impact from a government's fiscal perspective because the interest cost is a large component. So faster the, the government can bring the interest rates down, that has a material impact on the fiscal position of the country as well. That's, uh, that's, in, that's uh, a summary in terms of what we are looking at the economy. I would be happy to take questions uh, when we uh, have our session later. Thank you so much. Now it's time for the most awaited panel discussion. We are really honored that we have three distinguished panelists who will be discussing about shifting the economic and business strategy from resilience to recovery. And with the greatest difficulty, I managed to summarize their profiles and experience because three, three panelists' achievements and track records were over 15 pages long per person. Our first panelist is Ms. Kasturi Wilson, Group CEO and Executive Director of Hema Holdings PLC. She serves on the board of National Development Bank PLC as non-executive director, along with several other Hema subsidiaries in the healthcare, consumer, and mobility sectors. Kasturi is an active member of several industry associations and currently serves on the main board of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. Our next panelist is Mr. Sanat Manatunga, Managing Director, CEO of Commercial Bank of Ceylon PLC. Sanat also acts as the Managing Director and serves on the board of Commercial Development Company PLC. He is also the Deputy Chairman of Commercial Bank of Maldives Private Limited, a licensed commercial bank in Maldives. Our final panelist is Mr. Hasita Prem Ratna, Managing Director, Brandix Lanka Limited. He is also an Independent Director at John Kills Hotels PLC, where he serves as the chairman of the audit committee as well. Hasita is also an independent director at NDB Bank. 
The panel discussion will be moderated by Nakia Shiraz from CAL. Can we have the panelists and the moderator on stage, please? see all of you uh, friendly faces here today. Um, thank you to everyone joining here, as well as those of you joining online. Um, today is the last and final discussion uh, taking place for the Restart Sri Lanka 2023 Summit. Um, as Kanishka mentioned earlier, over the past three days, we have brought, uh, brought together both local and international experts to highlight their thoughts on Sri Lanka's macroeconomic landscape and focused on investment uh, opportunities for Sri Lanka going forward. To bring this uh, specific conference to a close, uh, as Damien very uh, clearly mentioned, we have uh, an esteemed panel of guests joining us today to talk about how their respected uh, businesses in their specific industries have adapted to navigate this new recovery phase, post-crisis, and the lessons they've learned um, along the way. Uh, before we begin, uh, I'd like to have a quick housekeeping note to everybody joining us here and online. We will want to be ta making this uh, discussion as interactive as possible, so towards the end we will be taking questions from the audience. And those of you joining online, please send in your questions and I'll take as many as I can towards the end. Without uh, further ado, Mr. Hasitha, I'd like to start off the discussion uh, and pose the first question to you. Um, as we all know, the apparel sector is one of the largest contributors to Sri Lanka's uh, exports. In light of the tough and very volatile period in our domestic economy of late, as well as the global slowdown uh, in global demand, can you tell us a little bit about what your expectations are for this industry performance going forward and if there's any signs of the industry recovering? Yeah. My audible. Yeah, so first of all, thanks for having us here. Um, talking about the recovery, before I get to the recovery, I'll just quickly take a minute to explain the drop or the, what happened in the last probably nine months. Uh, till about uh, last September, that is 2022 September, things were going pretty smooth. Then I thought uh, we recovered much faster than what we should have from COVID. That's probably the cause for the crash uh, that we saw thereafter. Uh, because there were two things that were happening. Uh, main thing was about inventory story, right? Because inventory um, <clears throat> was built up at two levels because when uh, US government started to pump uh, cash into people's hand in 2020, 2021, uh, people stood at home, probably didn't have much to do, went online and started shopping, right? So they were buying and online sales of almost all the brands took to about 60%, 50% levels. Uh, and uh, we, felt the recovery, as I said before, we probably much faster than what we thought in 2020 and 2021, because uh, obviously uh, these online sales started to pick up a, a sharp demand. And then people put them into their wardrobes, and they started to basically uh, realize that we have about okay, maybe 10, 12 months of inventory at home. So that's the first level of inventory. And they didn't have a place to wear it because COVID restricted the movements. The second thing is that the brands, our customers like Victoria's Secret, uh, Calvin Klein, etc., they also thought that, wow, things are moving pretty fast, right? And uh, there were supply chain disruptions due to logistics issues, China closing down, Vietnam having issues, and, 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 in, and different parts of the world getting into trouble time to time due to COVID. So they also started to uh, increase their buy, probably 10, 20 percent of additional buy which led to more inventory in their warehouses. So inventory problem was actually two layers, at home of the consumer and warehouse of the buyer. So when the uh, COVID started to settle, the logistics issues started to settle in 2022, uh, we also saw the um, travel coming back gradually. And people thought, wow, uh, now it's time to go after two years, to, uh, maybe around the world or wherever. 
right? And then naturally, you had enough clothes at home to wear because you have built up your wardrobes as well. So they said, okay, let's not uh, prioritize clothing by, let's go for travel in terms of priority and other means. So that brought in a sharp drop than what anybody, have, anybody would have imagined in this whole uh, apparel buy or the fashion related product buy. It's not only apparel, but really like applies to some of the other products in the uh, US and European markets. So this drop, as I said before, was led by this inventory. And then we saw the slowdown in the US economy coming in with the interest rate increases, inflation, etc. So that was a double whammy. Uh, and that kind of brought in a 30-40% drop within a very short period of time. And in this industry generally, we, we have seen many drops, but we have not seen a sharp drop in such a short period of time like this in the past. At least um, Ashraf says 46 years he's been in the industry that he has not seen it. So let's not talk about others. So I, uh, my experience is about 17 years in the industry, so I have not seen it. But for a very long period, this is the type of a drop was not witnessed in a short period of time. So while the drop took place, the other big thing that uh, came in was the price reductions. Because uh, obviously everybody was open in their capacities, Bangladesh to Vietnam to China, India, Africa, everybody. So it was a huge uh, price war because it was a buyer's market and suppliers uh, naturally had to offer whatever the price discounts that uh, went in. And while we're talking about export numbers dropping, on one side it's a volume drop, but the other side it's also a price drop. So that's the impact of the dollar, uh, dollar, dollar level drop that we have seen. So that's the context of where we are today before I say, talk about the recovery because, uh, because you need to understand where we are, right? Uh, and now from here, I think the good news is the April, May, June quarter, that's second quarter calendar, probably we've seen the bottom, right? We've seen the bottom, at least the drop has stopped. Uh, but the recovery that we are seeing now is very, very slow. It's slow, but yet recovering. So the good news is we are recovering. Uh, but the bad news is that it's recovering very slow, gradual recovery. So quarter on quarter, we are seeing improvement as we speak. Um, and probably it might take about a nine months for us to feel, but still there will be a sharp drop in the, in the or rather compared to where we were maybe a year ago, uh, still there will be, there'll be a drop even after nine months time when it comes to the overall demand position. So that's the uh, uh, picture that we are seeing today. Uh, but more importantly, the price reductions that came in uh, in the last uh, maybe nine months because of the severe competition will not uh, recover. I would think it won't recover at all, right? In the sense it will see some level of improvement from where it was, but it will not come back to where it was. What that means is that obviously we'll have to change the game, transform the industry to look uh, very different to what it looked like probably in the past. And that's what most of the apparel players are doing today, including the textile players, uh, changing how we do things and try to transform uh, uh, the whole uh, game. And obviously, uh, that should bring the cost down to a level that we can stay competitive and relevant. Surely, the exchange rate last year helped us uh, because it, it did uh, depreciate <coughs> to some uh, uh, sizable level. Uh, and that has uh, kept Sri Lanka competitive, I would say, to a large extent because the other countries did not see the same level of depreciation, but most of the countries did see. Even if you take a Bangladesh, for example, the Bangladesh saw about nearly 30% depreciation in the currency, right? And most of the other countries, India saw about 15% uh, and few other countries if in, the, in this context saw uh, fairly sizable uh, depreciation, but we, our depreciation was much more than them, so that kept us intact uh, in terms of the cost competitiveness. Uh, secondly, the bigger conversation is uh, more, more about how we are going to bring the technology and, and uh, those aspects and try to see how uh, the, these to, to cater in this uh, recovery phase uh, to be competitive and win the business to ensure that it doesn't go out of the country. So from a Sri Lanka perspective, that's the main change that we'll have to drive as an industry to ensure that we gain during the recovery rather than we lose during the market recovery. Thank you, Mr. Hasifa. I'm sure we'll all be very interested to dig a little deeper in terms of the technology that you were mentioning and, of course, in terms of um, how Sri Lanka can be better in terms of competitive in, uh, in international markets. I'd like to ask Mr. Sanat next in terms of a broader perspective in terms of the bank industry and from your experience, 
Um, can you elaborate on um, what the overall strategy has developed uh, in the operating environment of banks over the past few months? And were there any specific measures that you adopted to kind of help uh, navigate in this current environment? Yes. Uh, now, if you look at uh, Sri Lankan economy, <coughs> we had the issues uh, well in advance than other economies. Uh, before COVID, we had the Easter Sunday attack, so our industries were uh, fragile when we met up with this economic and political turmoil because we had the Easter Sunday attack, COVID, and uh, the economy was already fragile. So during the last one year, if you have seen uh, every industry went through a lot of difficulties uh, in terms of uh, foreign currency liquidity, interest rates, inflation, taxation. So ultimately, uh, any financial risk could come into the banking sector by way of a bad loan. Last uh, maybe one to two years, the banks had been supporting the customers by way of monitoriums, rehabilitation, uh, because uh, after COVID, we have seen a lot of SMEs, even tourism sector was suffering. Construction is all still suffering from these uh, uh, different issues we have faced. So our message across the industry, not only our bank, uh, to have empathy and understand the customer needs because, because different customers have wanted uh, different ways of uh, looking at their problems. And having said that, certain sectors like exporters were doing well, then uh, import substitutes had been uh, a priority sector where we, when the uh, foreign currency liquidity was not available. As a country, we learned a lesson that local industries should be looked after. So while protecting certain industries and supporting, banks were predominantly supporting the industries which face difficulties to come out of the issues. So regulatory forbearance was given uh, uh, in, at different intervals from the pandemic to the economic crisis. So banks had a uh, kind of a uh, uh, conducive environment to navigate and help the customers out. So it had been the priority. Then uh, during the last six to nine months, we had to even prioritize the sectors where we allocated foreign currency. Uh, maybe uh, from the second, uh, first quarter of this uh, year, the banks are flush, flush with foreign currency, but when the country went into default, the first thing what happened was uh, we lost access to uh, foreign currency markets. Even as uh, number one private bank, we were struggling to open LCs for our customers. So in terms of, uh, in any business, especially in banking, liquidity is uh, the priority. So one lesson we learned is that liquidity in terms of rupees and dollars, both should be managed and your stress testing, the risk management framework uh, came into a practical test. Uh, when the currency was scarce, uh, the foreign currency was scarce, uh, we had to prioritize sectors like essential food items, uh, f uh, fuel imports, pharmaceutical, fertilizer. So every uh, morning, the top management sat for about two hours and prioritized. To that, that extent, the management of every bank came into the flow and uh, we were fighting a, a battle every day to prioritize and help out the customers and even non-customers. Certain non-customers also came to bigger banks so uh, that uh, their business could be run and if those were not supported as an industry, ultimately uh, the economy will not have this kind of recovery. And if you see our economy is not a very big economy, uh, we are talking of let's say in a good year about 7 billion remittances, 5 billion uh, in uh, tourism, and 12 billion in exports. Exactly two months, uh, sorry, uh, 2 billion a month imports into 24. That is, uh, 12 months is 24 billion. What we were missing was that about 4 5 billion loan payments. So, in an economy like that, since uh, as a country we had experienced this type of disasters, we navigated well. The recovery had been faster. So, next question is as you us what we are going to do now. As a banking sector, we have a huge responsibility to uh, be a part of the uh, rebouncing of economy. So because of that, uh, when the interest rates had a sharp increase as responsible lenders, we didn't go to increase our loan books. 
we had a month on month negative growth in the loan book from last june to this june as uh, presented uh, from june there is a uh, maybe a uptick of the uh, uh, loan growth to the pri private sector which is a very good indicator to support the economy so the banks have reduced the lending rates the plr had been about 28% which has come below 15% at the moment so we have seen two impacts one thing is the credit demand could increase at a reasonable rate as mentioned by the earlier presentation we also believe the plr could go down to about 12% by end of the year if you look at the composition of any bank in sri lanka we easily have about 40 to 50% of the loans on floating rates plr based so when the eco econ economic crisis happened when the interest rate went up to about 25 30 levels uh, half of the loan book repriced uh, by about threefold from 8 10 percent to about 30 percent which uh, which is not bearable by a borrower so when things are settling down the banks are ready to pass on that benefit and to support the economic revival uh, so loan growth is one and other thing is uh, we have uh, show, uh, seen a uh, plateauing effect on the NPA because obviously we budgeted uh, as an industry we thought the non-performing loans could be about 15 percent by now but it's uh, hovering around 13 percent and uh, the the growth has uh, muted so that's a good news so interest rate uh, reduction has a positive uh, 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 correlation to the non-performing advances also obviously and the banking sector uh, uh, maybe uh, given a lot of moratoriums and restructuring and rehabilitation uh, support during the last one year. So those loans with these interest rates reductions, those can come into uh, the green uh, zone by end of the year. So that's another positive uh, trend for the industry. And uh, these industries will uh, look at expansions. We have seen even large corporates who are having uh, capacity expansions, uh, factory expansion, they uh, stole these uh, uh, maybe mid last year. Those will uh, uh, be supported by the banks and uh, even uh, some of the issues in uh, sectors like renewable energy, they, are, they have all uh, sorted out and they, these uh, proposals are now coming uh, our way. Uh, but uh, industries like construction, the government should prioritize and support them because tourism, construction, these industries will feed into the entire value chain in the economy and for uh, 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 bigger stimulation to the economy could be achieved by supporting these uh, broader industries. Thank you, Mr. Thanks. Um I'd like to uh, ask the next question, Ms. Kasturi, uh, but, and of course uh, go into more of the uh, points that you mentioned in terms of non-performing loans and some of the sectors that you mentioned in, within the, the course of the discussion. Um, Ms. Kasturi, economies as a whole are changing rapidly, and even Mr. Sanat said how important it is to have that customer-centric view when it comes to running businesses. Um, how do you think the consumer brand side of your business has kind of been affected uh, within the crisis that's happened? How has consumer trends uh, shifted? Do you see any trends that would persist over the coming, coming years in terms of how consumers react? Um, so thanks. Um, so um, quite a bit of our portfolio is in consumer brands, about 45% of it. Um, what we actually forced to do well was understanding consumers better. So whether it was COVID, uh, you did see consumers like in, in the global markets, people spending because they were not spending on discretionary stuff, they did spend on uh, consumer product. But um, when the financial crisis hit, while we over Im we impacted in terms of how we function, excess of dollars or uh, the interest rates, consumers also were impacted. Uh, their livelihoods, um, their, um, the interest costs, their, their lifestyles were some on borrowings and the inflation, right? And um, so we needed to figure out anyway, while we are in the business, there is a consumer, but they were having their own struggles. And what we actually understood is they had to prioritize. So things like education, health, food was prioritized. But the rest, you need to fight to see um, how do we be relevant to them. What we understood were the consumers actually were strong on some where the value propositions or the, the product itself was 
so strong in terms of what it offered. Um, and there they were not willing to trade down on from that product, but they were looking for cost-effective options like pack sizes, um, they downgraded from 200 grams to 150. Um, so we need to solve for that. Uh, the second lot of consumers or the second categories or consumers were the ones who were downgrading for value for money. So you need to give functional products, you need to give effective products but which has a value for money uh, connotation to them. Either ways you need to be, as local companies, you needed to think strong of seeing what are we solving for them? Can our products stand the test of time? I guess solving that during crisis taught us a lesson. I think consumers will always have a changing um, need. Today, you would see, if you start giving credit and you see the economy growing, people by habit will forget and start consumption will again start, which will give a whole lot of problems in another two years and then you'll have another problem. Um, but again, that's their lifestyle. Uh, so we need to be out there and I think one thing which will be constant throughout is that um, they'll be looking at stand strong brands which are um, solving problems but standing with strong propositions, which is innovative, which is uh, um, actually feeling aspirational for them. Um, but the value for Mali segment, I think on certain categories will continue which because they're just buying it for functionality. We think it's brand, but they're willing to trade this way, that way for a five rupee, 10 rupee. Um, the pack sizes, now I see the pack sizes from small packs are going up. So I presume they are still, now they're moving up. So I guess these would be trends. Um, priority on health is still there, but that's going to be education health we see has picked up again, especially education. This same consu consumption pattern we saw last year with Sri Lanka, we see now in Bangladesh. It took a longer time to handle, uh, it, it, there was a delayed effect on how they reacted, but it helped us in adapting to Bangladesh as well. It was like, go with your proposition, make sure your pricing and the pack size, it's kind of a, we, we learned it the hard way here. But the lessons we learned actually brings back to whether you remove tariffs, protection, you need to be relevant to consumer. We cannot be saying that we are going to create here and the con uh, products which for the consumer has to be forced to buy versus be be going out there, understanding their rituals, understanding their day, uh, what works for them. And honestly, if you put our mind to it and try to crack it, it'll work. So I guess in the medium term, we still would have a mix of it. Either ways, they are not willing to give up some, some of their uh, uh, habits. They are willing to downgrade, but they are really st wanting strong propositions. So we can't be complacent anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor, for those very wonderful insights. Um, Mr. Sanat, you mentioned earlier in terms of uh, tourism uh, construction sectors that you think might be... Uh, kind of stepping forward in terms of growth. Um, so are there any specific s sectors, as you mentioned, any particular reasons why uh, you think those are the sectors that uh, will be growing ahead? And do you see any positive, uh, any sectors that you see are positive to lending going forward? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, one sector, the, as a country, we should prioritize the renewable energy. Mm. Uh, uh, climate financing had been in our uh, maybe uh, portfolios for some time. But uh, due to the counterparty risk and uh, non-payment, the industry got uh, discouraged for some time. But now the, uh, the, the formula has been set. And uh, there are uh, there's renewed interest in these projects and the investors are investing. So as a country, we need, we need to have this climate transition plan. We, we are one of the vulnerable countries. Uh, for that, even the government should have their own policy parameters and their initiative, their willingness to support these industries and also if countries like India can go for certain targets by 2035, a smaller economy, smaller country like us should have the, the government, uh, the policy consistency in these areas and also encourage the investors to go into uh, the, the climate financing and renewable energy. That's one sector. Then uh, healthcare and pharmaceutical. 
this is another sector we should we, are, we as a bank uh, in our risk appetite as a positive sector and uh, also uh, uh, exporters exporters from garments to traditional exporters to new kind of exporters entrepreneurs coming from sme sector should be encouraged because we have seen that we are depending on exporters very much but uh, whether we have done enough for export sector from uh, policy makers to boi to other agencies is uh, uh, was tested during the past then uh, import substitute uh, import substitute by of manufacturing and uh, also agriculture for example when india has a food shortage they impose uh, taxes recently they did that so while having fertile land whether we have uh, going to the scale of uh, other countries in agriculture is another priority sector we are looking at sustainable agriculture and also the scale we don't have the scale even the mahavali area we have seen the plots have been now passed on from one generation to other and uh, these have become the three four acres have become now half an acre so we have to find out ways and means uh, in uh, which we have to uh, we have to have the irrigation plan then also supporting the farmers by way of technical support as well as uh, localized knowledge in uh, different farming uh, and agriculture based uh, industries there is another industry is uh, bpo and it sector which we have not looked at as a sector bank banks are also not geared to finance this kind of sectors because you don't see a tangible business but uh, but unfortunately a lot of uh, skill migration happening even at the moment but it bpo sector is another sector we should be looking at uh, shipping aviation and ports is a key sector we have not leverage enough because uh, we have uh, big economies like india bangladesh pakistan having lot of trans shipments through sri lanka But whether we have leverage enough in these sectors only few corporates have gone in but uh, uh, as a sector we are supporting uh, shipping aviation and ports but we have lot of uh, headroom to improve in that sector if you look at singapore or hong kong one of the thrust uh, industries in their them their economy is shipping aviation and even passenger transit we we have not developed that yet. so those are the sectors which come into my mind uh, so we should be prioritize in the next 5 to 10 years as a country thank you mr sana i think leveraging on our international uh, markets is essential and mr hasli i'd like to uh, get your thoughts on how would you say sri lanka needs to stay competitive against international markets especially like bangladesh that continue to undercut, undercut um, on pricing and how do we continue to stay favorable Uh, as, a, as a as a destination for global retailers. Yes, so I think uh, first of all, uh, it's a productivity game that we need to play, right? So that's one of the key aspects that Sri Lanka has to focus on. Over the years, uh, if you look at from maybe in our industry when we started uh, the big growth in early 90s, versus where we are today, the one of the biggest challenges we have is that we've kind of come to that uh, people thinking that we are in a mature industry. right which means that uh, in a bangladesh you will work see if you if the law says you can work for 60 hours they'll work 60 hours or even more sometimes right whereas here law says 60 hours a week but uh, 54 is like the norm because we've got used to being you know uh, more uh, i don't want to say lazy but but it's kind of that right it's kind of that uh, which uh, challenges the productivity uh, game to a large extent uh, and uh, that whole competitive uh, edge moves towards bangladesh because of some of these obvious and basic things but not easy it's a cultural change it's a mindset change so it's something that we need to really work through uh, so that's on one side the other side of the productivity game is about how uh, we use the technology we use uh, digital and uh, actually get the benefits of automations and digital because most of the time what we found is that in the past at least that we talk about these nice words right and uh, we'll invest a little bit we'll have consultants coming and preaching but until the push has come to a point where you know we are back to the wall uh, that there is no choice we really don't drive the outcome 
that's the biggest challenge, right? So I think you know, it applies to everybody, not the apparel industry. Um, we have to drive the outcome and the benefit of productivity through digital automation and other technology means. It's not to say good to have, other guy is doing that, who I'm also doing. Uh, so we have to get out of that mentality and really look at driving those outcomes. So our game should be to say, how do we bring the cost per piece or cost per unit by at least 30 to 35% using these uh, different technologies and different uh, digital tools that we have. And believe me, it's possible, right? We have done a pilot in our transformation journey uh, and it really shows that it's possible to do that. So it's not a question of whether it's possible or not, but it's more about getting our mindset and that 60% of that change is not technology, it's here. It's in our heads. It starts from the top and it has to go right to the bottom. Uh, so that drive for transformation, drive for change has to come and there is no choice in this world we are living today. So we have to push for productivity gains uh, through these means to uh, not only by working hard but also by working smart uh, to uh, be competitive and stay relevant to uh, fight Bangladesh type of uh, competition that's coming uh, from the global arena. The second uh, aspect uh, talk, uh, going beyond productivity is the market access. Now, for us to stay competitive, uh, I think the, the free trade agreements will also play a very important role. So if you look at today, Sri Lanka has GSP plus duty-free access to fair amount of uh, goods, not all goods, but fair amount of goods to the European market. But any other, none of the other um, uh, growing markets or at least meaningful markets, we have uh, a meaningful FTA we have with India. But apparel, if you take, it's uh, capped at 8 million pieces, which can go up to about a maximum $50 million, which definitely is not enough. We can do a lot more, uh, but, uh, but unfortunately, that's capped at the moment. So we need to work to take that cap out, and that's a huge growing market next door, which is our next uh, opportunity to really drive. Uh, with uh, FTA benefits, we can probably grow significantly, but even without FTA benefits, still there is opportunity to grow. And, and we need to work on that aspect to see how we reach out to uh, make most of the growth in the Indian domestic market. So that's uh, the market access story, but obviously other uh, FTAs are spoken about, but US very unlikely to give us a, a free trade agreement. But if you take Bangladesh, Bangladesh is duty free to their, uh, their LDC, least developed country. So they have the access duty free to Europe, uh, Canada, Australia, Japan, even partly China. So it's pretty much, and Bangladesh, sorry, India, and India, right? So I'll just tell you the example where India uh, exports from Bangladesh to India pre-FTA was almost like our size, few of 40, 50 million dollars. Today they are a billion dollars. Just within a very short three or four years of the FTA, that's what it has uh, brought in. So that's the opportunity I was talking about on the FTA and the market access, which is a very important uh, piece to stay relevant uh, in the overall scheme of things. And I think uh, going beyond productivity and market access, the other important uh, area to stay relevant in the competitive world is for us to uh, look at how we need to uh, bring different uh, skill sets to elevate the product and uh, find the niche markets that we can uh, uh, cater to, particularly from a product perspective. And Sri Lanka has done that quite well, particularly on the sports and the athletic wear side. Uh, with some of the leading brands, we have been able to successfully uh, play the game. Underwear side, lingerie business, we have a, a fairly a strong uh, hole there. But we need to keep innovating. We need to bring the newness to the product. And we need to ensure that this is a continuous game because Bangladesh is fast catching up. That's the, that's the problem, right? It was a uh, few years back, there's a big gap between the product capability of Bangladesh versus uh, Sri Lanka. But today, that gap is narrowing. And uh, most of our people are working there and transferring that knowledge. And they're getting from China, they're getting from everywhere, and uh, they're catching up very, very fast. So this advantage that we're talking about as newness, the innovation capability of uh, uh, Sri Lankan product, uh, need to continuously go uh, at a faster pace to ensure that we stay uh, relevant and obviously we stay ahead uh, with our customers to stay competitive. So those are the three big things I would look at. Productivity gain uh, is absolutely crucial. Uh, market access, and then uh, innovation and the newness that we need to offer to our customers. So these three aspects will really play a vital role to keep us ahead of competition and uh, keep the industry relevant. And I think that applies not only for apparel, but most export industry. Yeah, 
Thank you, Mr. Asifa. While exploring the ideas of competition and expansion into international markets, um, Ms. Kasturi, I'd like to pose the next question to you. With your experience and the group's uh, expansion into Bangladesh as well, do you see any challenges in the coming years uh, within the industry as well as uh, the economy as a whole? And kind of what strategies would you propose uh, to overcome the challenges in terms of moving into these uh, international markets? Yeah, so your question is on international, right? Uh, so we were late. Um, so apparel has been our flagship um, of exports and been excellent in, in what they do. And as a country, they came to us because you all set the benchmark. And you were forced to set that because your customers globally. And here we started looking at international. Of course, Bangladesh, we went so many years ago. Um, but how do you make yourself relevant out there? Because you're late in the day, and especially in consumer products, um, you've got the Unilevers and PNGs and all of that. So in Bangladesh, particularly, we took what we learned in Sri Lanka during crisis: is uh, how do you localize innovation and and give choice? So here, whether it's Atlas or whether it's uh, sorry, in the learning segment, we had choices of Atlas, the premium of Innovate, the value for money home run. Same in in uh, consumer, we launch beauty with localized uh, choices. So we actually went down that road there and, and decided, let's see, give choice, localize it. And um, here we think um, their hair fall, uh, we, one thing I learned was they put onion for hair, for hair fall. And I'm like, imagine saying that to a Sri Lankan consumer. But we put out a product which worked. So today, 16% of revenue in the last two years has come from new product. So we started localizing. Um, and what I realized in 12 months, whether it's, uh, it's the learning brand or, or consumer, we have very few things we can export. We can export some unique, um, in the consumer space, whether it's a unique ingredient anchored around it, innovation, whether it's cinnamon, whether it's Comarica. Comarica works globally, and that's tested is because they think it's unique, and it works. What else can Sri Lanka do? So you need to crack it from some of the unique, you know, whether it's cinnamon or whether it's tea or whatever. But the other thing is what we realized is we had a capability. In, uh, in Atlas, we were so seen as design, paper and plastics, but in small runs. How can you work? So we tried it, and we, we actually got a contract from Walt Disney Mid Middle East, which we do short seasonal runs for them in, for, their, for the kids' arts and crafts. Um, the difficulty we face is what um, Hasita said as well. There's so much of tariff barriers. Even our product tested in Bangladesh on Atlas on stationery, it, we got our proposition, it flew off the shelf, we pay 60% duty from here. And to market access it, you have to find a way of entering it, localized manufacturing. Um, very few countries can we export without having a tariff barrier. So it's very, while we crack the problem of understanding consumers and creating products, then you have to crack a problem of market access because we have not invested enough to even plug into a regional trade uh, agreement. So I think those are challenges, but at least the silver lining is you have one or two things you can compete in. Um, for example, Africa is loving Clogard because they use clove for toothache. No other country other than Sri Lanka uses it. Uh, Bangladesh doesn't use clove for a toothache. So, I mean, we have gone out and explored, and you have to choose niches. And once they trust a product, you have to extend the brand. So what I, the philosophy we worked was what worked in Sri Lanka will work out there doesn't work. The consumer is different. Each country has its nuances cul very culturally embedded. Ingredients very culturally em embedded. Rituals very cultural. But if you become excellent in understanding consumer insights, and is that a capability which can be lifted and shifted? And that's what we've tried. I think there's something we can crack. So I, it's going to be challenging, but it's interesting. And, and um, if we as a, we don't get the arbitrage of uh, procurement efficiencies, because we don't have raw materials, so we, and we, our quantity runs are small. But we can be excellent in, excellent in how we manufacture, whether it's uh, a lean or whether it's actually design and quality. So there are things we can learn from the apparel um, sector, where we can be the design house and we can charge premium. I guess 
where we have to crack it is what are the relevant countries which we have a right to win. And in those countries, try and choose one or two and go deeper into the consumer and see how we can create products which work for them. Thank you, Pastor. It was a very insightful points and a lot for everybody to think about. Um, before I ask the next question, just a quick reminder to the audience that we will be taking questions. Um, so please keep them on hand and we'll pass the mic around um, and then you can ask your questions. Um, Mr. Sanath, you mentioned earlier as well on um, NPLs and state three loans. Uh, if I could just ask you to dig a little deeper on that and um, kind of tell us, do you think the extent of rising NPLs, um, is, it, is the loans a problem and do you believe we are past the worst stage? Yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we expected uh, uh, worst case than what we experienced now. Uh, throughout the banking sector, we expected uh, the loans to uh, NPL to uh, rise uh, up to about 15 percent, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, so, I believe that we have come to uh, uh, maybe a put on the problem. And with the interest rate reducing, uh, potential NPAs could uh, reduce because the affordability and uh, this whatever we have restructured, uh, I think uh, the banks didn't increase the interest rates uh, where uh, the SMEs had problems. We maintained the same rates which we uh, gave over two, three years back. And these industries could uh, revive faster than what was expected. Then uh, when uh, the economy is uh, doing well, uh, the management overlays could uh, reverse into the PNL of the banks. For example, we uh, categorized certain risk elevated industries during the last two years, as uh, as uh, because from the pandemic to the economic crisis, uh, certain industries uh, had issues. So across the board, whether the particular customer was showing signals or not, uh, in terms of impairments, we had to impair them at least at stage two level as risk elevated industries. <coughs> so these risk elevated industries have uh, different uh, uh, maybe uh, indicators which we use. One is the economic factor adjustment, which reflects variables from the economic outlook. So when the economy is uh, improving, this economic factor adjustment come, uh, can be much uh, better than what it was expected earlier. So there will be impairment reversals in the banking sector in next three to six months because of the economic uh, uh, factor adjustment. Second thing is certain industries, statistically, if the in the, uh, maybe a portfolio, particular industry or a, per, a portfolio is uh, showing stress, according to the country standards, we had to uh, consider that sector as a risk elevated industry. So we have seen uh, during uh, the last few months uh, in our models, the risk elevated industry is getting uh, moved out to normal industries. So that also could create uh, some uh, buffers in terms of impairment uh, which we budgeted will not go in and also certain impairments we have made as management overlays can get reversed. So that's a positive thing because we still we don't know how the ISB, uh, the uh, restructuring will come into play. Uh, we believe that uh, it has uh, got delayed because of the DDO uh, issue. The superannuation funds uh, had to wait till the uh, the tax clear uh, tax issue was uh, cleared. So, when this uh, ISB restructuring, I would uh, think that it will happen at uh, maybe latest by about November. <coughs> so, when uh, that happens, the banking sector, I would. Uh, say that that is the biggest hurdle we had to pass more than the DDO. At that time, the banks will have more uh, cushion by way of capital and uh, uh, profitability to absorb the shocks. So we are talking of a haircut and possible day one adjustment. If the regu regulatory forbearance is not given, it will be a one-time hit to the bank's capital or the PNL. And also, uh, how the chartered account will treat the, the new bonds, which if there are bonds issued in foreign currency, uh, I don't think by that time the country will be in a better risk rating. So when a default issuer issue a bond, 
So um, uh, there would be uh, impairments on the new instruments as well. So while we are getting certain releases from the, uh, the loan side, this could cushion any potential impact on the balance sheet of the banks which are coming by way of ISB impairment uh, accounting. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Sanath. We do have a few questions coming in uh, from our online listeners. Um, is there anybody in the audience here who would also like to ask anything? Okay. Can we get a mic um, past this one? Thanks. Uh, my question is to Mr. Sitha. Uh, you very nicely explained the drop that we've seen in apparel demand over the last year and the part that excess inventory had to play in it. And you also mentioned that you're st starting to see somewhat of a pickup in orders. Would you frame those orders as a pickup which is more seasonal or do you think this is more sustainable? That's my question. Thanks. Good question. Uh, so, first of all, uh, the inventory problem with most of the retailers have got into a manageable level. In fact, uh, some of the retailers are going beyond uh, the manageable and talking about better inventory holding positions than uh, maybe compared to the past, right? So if they had had a, let's say, a inventory period of three months, holding period of three months, they're now saying, no, we will now hold for two months or two and a half months. So they're trying to even improve further. Uh, but Broadly, the inventory problem that I spoke about has now been addressed to a large extent by discounts, various means they have got rid of the stocks. So that's a good news. In fact, that, that really says that when the market picks up uh, gradually, we will also see the similar level of pickup from the retail uh, uh, to the supply chain. Otherwise, uh, when the market picks up, they were still selling basically the, the stocks or the inventory. And that uh, definitely uh, created a challenge in terms of getting the orders down to the supply chain. But now uh, it's kind of real, right? Like I said, the, the, the retail improvement is relatively small, slow. Uh, it's not uh, to the level that one would have liked it to be. Uh, so that pickup which should reflect in the purchases and the orders that are coming to us. Uh, but having said that, like you very correctly said, uh, the season starts towards uh, October, November, December 3rd, uh, or the fourth quarter of this year, and maybe the first quarter of the next calendar year is really the season, uh, which in the financial year of us, which runs from April to March, it's really the second half is the season. Uh, so when you talk about that improvement, gradual quarter on quarter improvement, one can always argue that is that the seasonal effect that you're seeing uh, more than really the uh, improvement overall. But uh, only uh, positive, I mean, uh, that has a logical point, but the positive side to the story there is uh, uh, with the inventory reduction, right? There is a clear uh, need for new product because for the last three years, if you look at uh, the newness of the product has not been great. If you go and shop in US, uh, maybe if you are shop, uh, going there after three years, you might still see uh, same type of products there. If you had been uh, in the last one year, you would have go there, uh, gone, come back and say that hey. Three years ago, in 2019, when I went, also we had the same product because uh, retailers are more interested in selling the product out and getting the inventory out from the time of 2020 onwards. You remember high inventory at the time of the COVID uh, lockdowns, and they were going out there, and it was more about getting the product and somehow selling. And people were also not really worried about newness, etc. They were having fun with the purchases online, and it was a very different uh, consumer behavior at the time. But for the first time, we are seeing that change now coming in. People are looking for, consumer is looking for newness. They are kind of rejecting and saying, hey, discounts are good 50% down, but this is all the stuff that I have in my wardrobe. What am I going to do with it again? I, I, I need uh, newness and fashion out there. So there is a little bit of a hunger coming for the fashion, which will drive that additional new product and the new sale. Uh, so even if you argue on one side that this is the seasonal benefit, it's really a recovery in that sense from a product perspective. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Yeah, good evening. Uh, I think the gentleman that uh, heads up the research department uh, mentioned that uh, in the last year we've had about 500,000 people leave this country. 
and apparently the boats are still full. So how are you guys going to deal with this issue going forward with uh, our president sort of uh, mentioning that you know, there are lots of new taxes coming in the future and so on? I think that uh, you're going to see continued uh, immigration from this country. How are you guys uh, adjusting to this and what are you looking at to sort of uh, stop this from happening or uh, adjust your businesses so that uh, you're not affected by it? I think all of us are going through that and you're very right. Um, I think some industries most over like technology industries had a high attrition but we all face it and we still face it. Um, I guess what we can't solve for everything, what we need to, we as an organization had to do was make sure we understand who is really core in terms of our strategy and, and that talent had to be taken care of. Um, and then uh, making sure that uh, we kind of take care of them in a way that, that my, the movement that where the inflex point is kind of very narrowed. However, I think Asita uh, alluded it to bef be before, as, a no, as companies, we need to now work on being efficient. Our structures, we have a 75-year-old company with structures and, and, uh, and the way we operate being so, it makes us slow, but it also builds cost. So we need to make, to make sure that we kind of be simpler and faster, A, to be more competitive, B, to be able to survive this when and uh, for the future. Uh, these costs have to be recovered in terms of efficiency and in terms of volume growth. It's not um, that uh, we shouldn't. So I guess how I look at it is, look, this is talent. If we are going to be relevant, we need to keep them. But I would also add a, another thing. How can we take this company to be a bigger company? How can we grow faster? Can we do something better? Because we need to aspire to do much better because if we are going to be happy at the way we operate and try to retain global talent, it's not going to last. You're going to be relevant and they will leave eventually. So we can create some stickiness for the short term. If you want to keep them in the long term, you need to make sure there's, there's excitement in the job. Um, there's, it's growing and we are more global and, and not only local. So um, I guess uh, Hasta has the same problem with us, uh, with the parallel. I'll, I'll give it over to him. Yeah, I think the, the critical point uh, is, uh, like Kasturi said, to uh, look at the skill and the skill that you really need to protect. So that's, that's one of the key things we did, that uh, we had to ensure that we uh, protected that part of the skill. And uh, initial phase so far, uh, because of the market downturn, we haven't felt the real impact of what your question really, the, the labor migration, because in fact, uh, to a large extent, the reductions, anyway, we had to do whether we like it or not. And with the attrition, uh, it kind of went okay, right? So, so it, at this point of time, one would rather uh, call it not necessarily a big problem. But the problem will come when things turn around and when we really need to grow. Right, as economy, that's the problem. Right now, we are not feeling the, pro the pain or the problem to the level uh, that it is. Um, so, so that's where we will have to figure out how to bridge the gap. So two things I, I'm, I'm looking at really, uh, not necessarily as an industry, but as a country we should do. Uh, number one, we need to really understand the technical skill gaps that are going to set in and look at uh, bringing those skills either from expat employment or even trying to get some of these people to come back uh, at a different price point, different salary point, different uh, uh, level, but that is to a very smaller crowd because we can't afford to do that for everybody. And then for the other category, we need to accelerate the training and uh, grooming of those people to step up. And this is something that uh, we seriously looked at, uh, especially as industry we need to do on one side because uh, each industry has to uh, kind of collaborate and do these type of things in scenarios like this rather than trying to do as individual companies. Uh, so there may be in certain categories of skills, we have to upgrade, particularly if you look at uh, uh, from the, our, if you take uh, the, the girl who sits in that the machine and operate the machine. Actually, uh, if you compare with Bangladesh, Bangladesh literacy levels are much lower than ours, right? We have 90 plus percent 
literacy level. But historically, if you look at, we have treated the, the girl who operated the machine the same way as Bangladesh. So in fact, we have not recognized her literacy level. So what we have uh, noticed in the recent past is that if we empower them, if we give them, make them more digital savvy uh, and get them to really do more work and take more responsibility, they can actually deliver. In fact, I'm talking with uh, proven experience. Uh, it works, right? It's just that our mind is the biggest problem. We think that uh, she can only do this, but actually she can do much more in her supervisor's job as well. Uh, so in certain parts of our organization, we have promoted the smartphone usage because that's really the core to digital. And with that, uh, suddenly someone whom we thought that only who can operate a machine can today, the girl can uh, move the tab. And when they give the tab, the supervisor doesn't uh, have to now come and tell her how many should be produced today and how many should be done this hour. She can figure that out by herself because she has the literacy on one side and on the other side, she now is digital savvy. So that change is something that we need to move fast. And in some of our factories, 98% of the girls use smartphones. And that's the test really whether you're digital savvy or not. And that's what we're encouraging today. I think uh, with the banks, we have partnered to say that, okay, I, do, I can use uh, one name, the Solo app or whatever that's there. So we've uh, put that app there and said, hey, why don't you buy your stuff uh, that we have this uh, thing called Polar, which uh, uh, in each factory we have uh, uh, purchases. So we try to see whether they could uh, purchase through the online uh, channel online that uh, particular app and make them mass smartphones savvy and give a discount. So then you start using more and more, right? There's somebody, some factories which were at about 40% digital, now we have moved to about, when I say digital, I'm talking about smartphone. That's the first phase of digital uh, for the individual. So that has moved to 60, 70, and some places to 98%. Uh, we encourage them with certain amount of uh, support to buy the smartphone. Uh, and they're making them digital savvy means that we are creating a workforce which has the capability to go beyond. So that's the upgrade we need to do. It's not really to send them on college and uh, do smart uh, classroom training. That is needed, but it's more than that. It's on the job, these little tweaks we need to do. And I think digital is the game that we need to change. So that's where I, we, a lot of workforce that's uh, already available need to be upgraded very fast uh, to cater to some of the other jobs that they can do. Uh, and that will definitely help to uh, counter the next level of the, not the top skill I, uh, you're talking about, but the next level of the skill that is there. So it's all in our hands. I think it's up to us really to rally around and do this rather than maybe crying foul about that 10% who's going to go anyway. And uh, I didn't realize uh, until I saw in Udishan's presentation that anyway, 200,000 are going anyway, right? 18, 19, 200,000 have gone. So uh, it's 355 and maybe another 350 this year, or maybe a little more than that this year. So 10% of the workforce will anyway go, but let's prepare for that and make sure that uh, we upgrade the people gradually is really how, how we are approaching it. And, and I think if we do that, we can. So like I said, it's not about, uh, like I said before, it's not about uh, we moving or we are talking about, it's about as uh, different parts of the organ product capabilities and the organizations have had uh, different requirements from moving the products by the uh, customer requirements. So what we have done really is to look at Sri Lanka to grow with the productivity uh, and like I said, to improve uh, uh, different dimensions. So with the market recovery, we will have about 30% more capacity that we can have with similar type of infrastructure with uh, the type of technology and the digital uh, uh, requirements to bring in. So right now we have not done uh, any movements out, uh, but uh, uh, some of these expansions that we have done in the past uh, have been uh, coming into full uh, level in, in, in other parts, Bangladesh, India, Haiti, Cambodia, etc., and other parts of the world. So some of those capacities have been actually growing. Thank you. Um, the three of you represent a very select club of uh, Sri Lankan businesses that have succeeded internationally. Uh, why do you think more of our businesses aren't succeeding internationally and what's holding us back? 
any of you can answer it. Uh, I'll give our story. We went to Bangladesh in 2003 by acquiring Credit Agricole Bangladesh. So actually, this question we also asked from ourselves how we invested only $20 million at that time. Now it is uh, about tenfold uh, increase in the investment and also 30% of the bottom line the last year came from Bangladesh because of impairments. So one thing is uh, cultural proximity. The Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, we have a uh, very good understanding among the people. As uh, Hasidha said, even the uh, Sri Lankans have created that uh, the, the professional vibe in Bangladesh long before we went also still common industry even in other industries uh, are managed by uh, financial management uh, the, at CEO level the Sri Lankans have been accepted uh, by Bangladesh market uh, when we went there we had an issue because Credit Agricole had been a, a multinational operating in Bangladesh and uh, a smaller bank from a smaller country how could we manage so there we need to leverage your own strengths. If you look at commercial bank, till about 1990s, we were more strong in corporate and trade. We came into the retail business much after other competitors. So we leveraged. To date, we are very strong in corporate and trade in Bangladesh than retail or SME. We increased the branch network from two, from branch, uh, two branches to 21 now. We are the third largest foreign bank in Bangladesh and uh, we are, compared to the industry, we have a very clean balance sheet because we played on our key strengths, corporate banking, trade and we manage the relationships. Now, it actually paid uh, off even during the crisis. None of the corporates who and multinationals, some are not banking here but we manage to retain multinational in Bangladesh to bank with the uh, uh, Sri Lankan bank. So during even the crisis, we have built the, the, the brand image in Bangladesh as a AAA bank for the last 10, 12 years. So even our customers who had large deposits didn't panic while the head office was in Sri Lanka. So that is because we have uh, shown the resilience in the business model in Bangladesh. So we have a good capital adequacy, liquidity, a customer base, a franchise in Bangladesh which we have built. So those are the learning points from our experience. To date, uh, uh, even uh, during the crisis, Bangladesh was supporting Sri Lankan uh, uh, treasury uh, by way of dollar liquidity. So we have, uh, that is because they consider us as a local uh, foreign bank. A foreign bank operating locally which has the depositors, the uh, uh, borrowers, the trade finance customers, everybody. So as a entity, they are resilient and uh, they have shown that resilience. So um, our entry into Bangladesh was with that single product of Comarica and we thought, okay, that cracked it and we had one product which worked here, which worked there and uh, I think it became the number one hair oil till 2018 when um, there were some counterfeits and the brand took a hit, so it dropped down to five. And, um, but what worked is in Bangladesh is we spent enough time to understand the consumer. They respected Sri Lankans. We had built an ecosystem in terms of a distribution network as well, which we own. Um, so today what we we've pivoted Bangladesh is, um, yes, Komarika was what worked here, but the rest of the products we put in, uh, we put two other hair oil brands there and a soap category, which is doing phenomenally well is what works for them. So we moved from what works here as a product to understanding we move the capability of consumer insights to creation, localizing it, and that's what's working. We are unleashing or we are trying to build on the network of distribution which is because it's an asset. And there's a German company which we've just contracted to distribute the same footprint of distribution products which go into, which complement Comarica. And again, why they signed up with us is I guess there's there's something Sri Lankan companies bring in terms of professionalism if you stay the hall and you work. Um, and for us, because we work with pharma companies and we are forced to be bringing governance to the forefront and being transparent, it works. So how can we exploit that is in a market which is so protected and people want to operate, it's a big market, 
how can a Sri Lankan company go there and win contracts? So you have to be a bit more creative. Um, the other markets are, which is culturally, we fail. I mean, I, we pull back is Myanmar. And, and culturally, we couldn't understand that consumer in terms of healthcare. Um, it was so fragmented, so ungoverned that it was difficult for a Sri Lankan company to stomach it the way we would. Why other companies will struggle is, I think going is, A, you should be ready for the long haul. Unless you have a portfolio or a capability of like the f biscuit companies have the capability of doing formulations and good crackers, but we might not know how to talk to that consumer there. So we need to be able to stomach it and be open to change certain products or names. Others, we are so married to our brand name here that we think it's, you're not going to compromise. They can't even pronounce certain brand names there. So um, I guess that's a change. But I think from a country perspective, what we need to crack is how can these SMEs export? They might have one unique product. And it can globally work. But they don't know who the cons what consumer will like it. They don't know how to enter that market. Um, some of the companies might go in as us, but others, it'll, it'll be a struggle because you either burn a lot or you're going to burn a little for a long time. It becomes so irrelevant that they'll pull back. Yeah, I think the, like, just adding on to what Sanat and Kasuri said, in, 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 in other words, I think it's about deep pockets. So larger companies will have that advantage compared to SME for sure, uh, because uh, all our international experiences when we set up things, uh, it was a game of uh, sort of you needed the patience, you needed the deep pockets to uh, uh, continue because initially it's kind of loss making, you have setbacks and you need to have that resilience to fight back and come out of the challenges and once you make the switch then probably the uh, gains are much more significant. So the critical part will be that deep pocket so if you're, if you're going as SME you need to at least estimate that initial outflow and plan for that outflow so that then you'll be able to weather the storm and kind of face the challenges without uh, just rushing back home saying that this won't work, right? Uh, so that's one big thing. The second thing, like Sanat said, the cultural thing, I think that's, that's a very, very important aspect because most of, the time, most of the time what we do is we go there and try to make it a Sri Lanka, right? Now that you can't do. You have to realize that you've gone to a much bigger, larger audience and you have to see how the local uh, requirements and lo local operating model is and see how you need to adopt to that model and you need to have people on one side taking certain prerequisite skill sets to transform that particular location and on the other side you need people who will then back off and say now we will adopt to the situation because most of the time people fail because you try to push your agenda too far uh, whereas uh, you need to know to what extent you need to have those foundational requirements set up and then rest need to be localized without trying to uh, kind of put everything together. So that m mix is very, very important. That's where a lot of organizations or a lot of uh, international uh, expansions fail uh, because you, you really don't know where really you need to stop the, uh, your, your international agenda and then also bring the mix of that localization uh, requirement. Thank you. I think unfortunately we are running out of time for any more questions. Um, I'd like to say a, a huge thank you to our panelists for joining us. It's been a pleasure having you all here. And of course, uh, our audience, thank you for your questions and thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to uh, hand it over to Damien for, for the final remarks. A very big thank you to our wonderful panelists for those valuable insights. And thank you, Nakia, for moderating this uh, insightful session. Uh, May I invite Lai Ruhariya Ratna, Chief Growth, of Growth Officer, Cal Group, and CEO, Capital Alliance Securities, to distribute the tokens of appreciation for our panelists. <laughs>